in self-defense sure just exhaust all your options think about it i mean hey guys what's up welcome back to the channel my name is kennedy if you're new here if you're not new hey girl how have you been we're gonna hop into true crime today instead of like makeup today we're gonna do a little skin care keels sent me these props ooh, ooh, ooh. look at me trying to be trying to do stuff keels sent me these products but all three of these i've used before in the past and they're really good this deep pore cleansing mask is really good and they also have a deep pore cleanser that's kind of like the same texture as this but it like foams up i don't know how the like the clay cleanser like foams up but it is really really good this getting this in pr made me remember like i love that cleanser i need to repurchase that and then i got the creamy avocado eye treatment and then the ultra facial cream this is a great face cream super hydrating but like no fragrance yeah no fragrance it's just like a super clean product i'm almost out which is sick because i just got this but i literally slather this on the only product they sent me that I hadn't used is this nice cinnamide, but I love my cinnamide. And yeah, we're just going to get jiggy with our skincare today. It looks late at night, but it's like the opposite. It's super early. I'm going to film this, go relax and take a bubble bath. And then I'm going to come back and film a true crime and makeup video later on. It is Thanksgiving break and the kids are here. So I I can hear cartoons. I don't know if y'all can hear cartoons, but if you can, you already know the deal, child. I got kids. It is what it is. But we can hop into today's case. All right, guys. So a little background on today's case. It is August of 2016. Chloe Randolph. after graduating high school a year and a half early after working hard and being very diligent in roles in henderson community college in henderson kentucky where she was born and raised okay chloe enrolled in henderson community college because she was trying to jumpstart her nursing career she wanted to become a hospice nurse so she was very diligent in her studies. But Chloe, while in school, starts working with older, mentally disabled people in their homes. And she just loved it. She loved helping people in need. And she felt like helping people who couldn't help themselves was like her calling. So Chloe's in school and she's working keeping her head down and you know keeping her grades up but in the spring of 2017 she meets a guy gabriel abdukadir was this boy's name and he is from somalia and gabriel who was 19 had not been in the states for very long just for about a few months he was sent over to the United States to live with his sister, he and two of his other siblings because his parents wanted them to experience, you know, better things in the United States, that kind of vibe. Blah, blah, blah. So Gabriel hadn't been in America for long. Gabriel was in school for phlebotomy. They had similar prerequisites, you know, that kind of thing. So they crossed paths, they met, and they were inseparable. And their relationship kind of moves pretty fast. Um, just a few weeks into dating, Chloe brings Gabriel home to meet her father and her stepmother who raised her. So they were a very close-knit family, all right? Chloe's father had two children, Chloe and her brother Jason, with their mother. But shortly after the birth of her brother, they were divorced and Chloe and her brother ended up living with their father, okay? 
So she and her dad grew up super close. While he was working, obviously he needed help with his two kids. And then soon after that, he met Chloe's stepmom, okay? Who stepped in to raise them as her own, Chloe and her brother Jason. Chloe's stepmom was like the perfect mom. They loved each other. She stepped into that motherly role. She stepped into that motherly role for Chloe, you know, doing proms, homecomings, getting her ready, you know, that kind of thing. They were super, super close even for a blended family. So like I said, in spring of 2017, Chloe and Gabriel, they meet, she's bringing them home. And then by July, 2017, the two of them moved in together. And while fast, her family, her parents were supportive. Gabriel seemed to be the perfect gentleman. And he was very nice and mannerly to Chloe. And then by August of 2017, Chloe and Gabriel were married, okay? They had just kind of picked up one day and decided to go to the courthouse and get married and that's what they did. They went with some of their friends as witnesses and got married. She let her dad know she was married by sending him a picture of the marriage license because it was kind of just like a spur of the moment type of thing. And while her family was of course like shocked, her father and her stepmom had kind of gotten married in a similar way. They decided to get married. They had decided they wanted to be married, that they couldn't wait anymore. So they too just ran to the courthouse on their literal lunch breaks from work and got married and went back to work like it was nothing. So her family just trusted that Chloe was happy and, you know, went along with it. And then in September 2017, Chloe finds out that she is pregnant. It seems like as soon as two people move in together, they get pregnant. Or at least that's like a thing we say in my family. Do y'all feel that way? Chloe is a little apprehensive to tell her family. She's not sure how they will react, but I mean, Chloe is an adult. She's got her own place. She's living with her husband. So it's easy for her family, you know, to be excited. They don't judge or anything like that. They're extremely supportive. Which Chloe will soon need the extra support from her family. Gabriel started, you know, to switch up. He wasn't super involved in her pregnancy. Her stepmother went with her to most of her OB appointments even though they were living in the same house, he just seemed uninterested in welcoming the baby. And I hate when men act like they don't know, like sex means baby. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like every time you lay down, you risk it. Like, I don't know why men don't get that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like they, they be shocked that somebody is pregnant. How, how, you, you were doing the deed, but anyway. But Chloe, you know, even though she's lived in the house with her husband, seems to be, you know, welcoming her baby on her own, outside from the support from her family. And Gabriel is taking the back seat, not even a back seat, like the way back, the back of the bus. And her family could tell that she was hurting, that she didn't really like the way things were going. She didn't like that Gabriel was absent um, when it came to doing things for the baby. But she was seemingly trying to like save face and like make excuses for them, you know, trying to paint the picture of a happy home. You know, he was just tired. He was too this, he was too that to go to the appointments, things of that nature, you know. She didn't really shit on Gabriel for not coming and being involved the way he should have been. So her stepmom and her dad are taking turns, taking Chloe to all of her baby appointments, checkups, things of that nature, even though she has a husband at home. 
This brings us to June 13th, 2018. Chloe goes in for a scheduled C-section and she's ultimately there with just her parents and her stepmother plans to go back into like labor, not even labor and delivery. What do you call it when you have a C-section? Is it just like the operating room? I never had a C-section. I don't know how those work. I guess it would into the operating room. So, so yeah, she originally plans to go in with her stepmother there beside her, not her husband. It said that at the last minute, Gabriel steps up and he decides that he actually does wanna be there when the baby's born, when the baby pops out. So at the last minute, he comes in and steps into that role. And Chloe's parents oblige, you know, just to keep the peace out of, just to keep the peace, just to keep things copacetic and to focus on the baby, you know? So Gabriel, while present for the birth, is still not intending on having this baby around him every day. And as they're preparing to leave the hospital, he tells Chloe and her family that the baby can't come home to their house. That Chloe and the baby need to go home to her father and stepmom's house because he doesn't want a crying baby in the home with him, keeping him awake. Okay. What? And that just wasn't enough for him. Just a week after the baby was born, he decides to move out of the home that he shares with Chloe and the baby and move in with his sister for some peace and quiet. And Chloe is now a married single mother before she's even old enough to drink. And I used to always think about like being 21 <laughs> when I had my first baby and that's how I kept myself from not having any more babies. I was like, I refuse to be a mom of two kids before I'm old enough to drink, okay? But their baby is absolutely beautiful. I don't like to post people's kids. I'm not gonna do that. But um, there's plenty of pictures of this little boy. If you would like to go see him, he's very cute. But Chloe is rocking it, doing her thing, taking care of her baby, and everything is copacetic um, until she is disturbed in October of 2018 when Gabriel files for divorce. And shortly after filing for divorce, he files for full custody of their son and $500 a week in child support from Chloe. So falling off the face of the earth and not even wanting the baby to come home from the hospital with him. Six months into the baby's life, he's asking for full custody and child support at that. But you know they say like African men are either like the best men you'll ever meet or the absolute worst. So that is in October, November 2018, all right? Things kind of stall out during the holidays. Y'all know the court system is slow. But by March of 2019, Chloe's got her own lawyer and they're preparing to go to court. But before their court date comes up, Gabriel shows up at Chloe's home. He's asking to take the baby with him because he has family coming in town and he wants his family to meet his son. And she did not want to say yes at all whatsoever. But to keep the peace, she didn't want to cause like a yelling match or anything like that. She decides to let the baby go with Gabriel. And I think we've talked about this before, but like when both parents are on the birth certificate, there's really nothing you can do. It's not kidnapping, it's nothing like that. So if Gabriel decides to take the baby and not bring him back, which is ultimately what he does, there's really nothing Chloe can do. But, but we've talked about it before because I know a girl who did not see her child for like, I wanna say two years. That's how long it took the court system to help her settle a custody agreement with her partner because they were both on the birth certificate and her partner decided to come scoop the baby up and literally not bring their child back for years. She had not seen her child in years. So yeah, definitely keep that in mind. If he is on the birth certificate and you don't trust him to bring your baby back, 
and soon after leaving with their son gabriel starts taunting and threatening chloe saying you know if she doesn't pay child support she will never see the baby again and he's gonna leave the country with the baby which is some crazy ass shit you didn't even want the baby to begin with now you're about to leave the country men are so irrational i just can't deal legally i don't think he would have been able to get on a plane with the baby without the baby having a passport and i doubt since he was absent that the baby had a passport so he probably wouldn't have been able to leave the country with the baby i don't know i don't think that works like that but either way it's very scary very threatening um chloe decides to call her parents obviously so chloe's father and her younger brother that we mentioned in the beginning of the video now obviously much older they go over to where gabriel had been living and basically wait for him to pull up to see if they can you know get the baby from him so they wait outside of gabriel's apartment for him to pull up because they realize that he is at home when he does pull up there is somewhat of a confrontation okay so gabriel pulls up he has someone else in the car with him a friend of his and chloe's father is asking for his grandson but unfortunately in the car with him there's no baby they don't know where the baby's at chloe's father approaches the car and kind of jams gabriel up in the car because he thinks gabriel has a gun on his side so they are basically just arguing take me to the baby da, 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 da. you know y'all know type shit in the parking lot of this apartment complex so chloe's father's got gabriel like jammed up in the car trying to stop him from brandishing his weapon and quite frankly ready to die about his child as most fathers would be i can't say that my dad would have done anything differently okay but because it is a big huge hubbub and commotion um the cops are called by neighbors in the apartment complex so they're trying to come to some sort of resolution in this parking lot um chloe's father is trying to get himself in the car with gabriel and have jason her brother drive with gabriel's friend that's in the car with him like one-on-one -on -one, and you take me to the baby because i don't trust your ass like we're not we're not i'm not following you you're not about to lose me none of that we're gonna go one-on-one -on -one. each car will get the baby and go about our business but um before they can come to any kind of conclusion they chloe's father decides to leave the scene before police arrive but he does later turn himself in though gabriel decides not to press charges probably because he shouldn't have even had the gun to begin with you know so this just ends up being a big hubbub with no real resolution the day after this incident with chloe's father and gabriel chloe calls her father to say that gabriel told her you know she can have the baby back but if she wants to have the baby back, she needs to come get him right away. Chloe's father tells her to just wait. He was almost finished up with work and he would accompany her. But Chloe does not want to wait. And she says that Gabriel doesn't feel comfortable having him around after what happened the day before. That she was just going to go quickly to go get the baby and come right back. And that she would call him after the fact but unfortunately this phone call would be the last phone call chloe and her father would have this brings us to march 23rd 2019 after not hearing from chloe in a while her family calls in a welfare check and um, they know that chloe's not at her home so they call in a welfare check to gabriel's apartment and they cannot originally make entry into the home there's no answer at the door but there's also no probable cause that is until detectives in kentucky get a call from arizona did i say arizona i meant to say arkansas we're in arkansas gabriel had driven to arkansas with the, with the baby and called 911 from like the welcome center in arkansas and he was with the same friend he was with that was in the car with him 
during the altercation with Chloe's father, okay? So not only did Gabriel call 911 from the Welcome Center, but he was also called in by like just bystanders. People called into 911 saying that there was a man near the Welcome Center just like walking in the middle of the road, seemingly having some sort of like mental disturbance, okay? Police cars, detectives head out to him to see what the heck is going on. And he tells them that his spouse, his wife, had killed herself back in Kentucky. And detectives are like right off the bat, well, why the hell are you all the way in Arkansas? What's going on? So they're not even sure if there's any real danger, if there's anyone hurting or injured. They just think because of his state of mind that Gabriel's having some sort of mental breakdown. So they bring him, the baby, and his friend Isaac into the local police station in Arkansas, as well as calling in to Kentucky to let them know what's going on. So after they get this info from Gabriel of his wife possibly being deceased in the home, a detective, on top, on top of the welfare check, a detective heads over to the home to enter the home first in case this is a crime scene. And it is, unfortunately. When they enter the home, there's blood everywhere, blood spatter, bloody handprints. This was obviously the scene of some sort of stabbing from all of the blood spatter everywhere. The crime scene photos are very graphic. I'm not going to include them in this video because it's nobody needs to nobody needs to see that. Um, but down the hallway in like a coat closet, there's blood kind of pooling from underneath the door. Um, they opened the door to the coat closet, and Chloe's body was in the closet, and she'd been stabbed several times, and her well. So, in Kentucky, they're like, this is obviously a murder, like, obviously a brutal attack. But in Arkansas, Gabriel is telling detectives that she killed herself. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. And during this time, the baby is in the interrogation room with Gabriel. Once the different police departments exchange information um child services comes in and scoops the baby up obviously okay and he is taken in a police car back to kentucky and then for chloe's family this is kind of like a double whammy not only have they lost chloe their daughter their sister but they don't have the baby Gabriel, the baby's last living legal guardian, refuses from <laughs> custody to um, release the baby to Chloe's parents. So Chloe's parents have to go through the court system and file the baby out of the damn court system. Out of the court system. Out of the damn court system. Out of child services care. So once back with Henderson police, um, Gabriel is telling detectives that Chloe hit herself in the head with a hammer and then her own throat. Then when he realizes this story isn't really working for detectives, he decides to blame the whole thing on his friend Isaac. He said, Isaac did it all. Isaac hit her with a hammer. Isaac hit her throat. Then he realizes that that story also is not working for detectives. So he then says that he did all this, beating her in the head with the hammer in self-defense. Sure, just exhaust all your options. Just think about it, I mean. So he eventually confesses to the murder. Um, he says after that he showered, cleaned up, packed the baby in the car with Isaac and they kind of just rolled around until they were in Arkansas and that's when he decided to finally call 911 and he came up with the suicide story but the crazy thing is after doing all this in the state of Kentucky Gabriel still had the legal right to Chloe's remains because that was his wife and so he refused to sign over these rights 
okay, to her family so they can go ahead and give her a proper burial. Luckily, you cannot make funeral arrangements or do anything like that from a jail cell. So the time ran out and then Chloe's family was able to have her body, do a proper burial, all of the things. But Kentucky, what kind of law is that? And if that wasn't crazy enough, Gabriel pleads and only gets 20 years for second degree. Hopefully when he is ready for parole in 2040. Ahmed, I mean, Kadir has now been charged with the murder of his estranged wife, Chloe Abdi Kadir. Henderson police transported Mohammed to the Henderson County Jail around 2.30 this afternoon after police in Arkansas arrested him there earlier this week. Police say Mohammed Ali Kadir admitted to hitting Chloe with a hammer several times and then a throat. Police say he then put her body in a closet, took a shower, and left. There were multiple calls, previous calls in reference to a uh, possible domestic or a verbal argument of some sort between the two um, prior to this incident. Couple had a nine month old son. Police say the child was found with Mohammed in our Arkansas and is safe tonight. And his parole comes with a side of deportation. Send him back to where the fuck he came from. Cause we got enough Looney Tunes in the States already. But Chloe's family, they get her body back. They're able to have a proper burial. Chloe's father and stepmother have full custody of her baby. And they also start the Chloe Randolph organization to bring awareness to domestic violence and to help women in those situations. Chloe's cases is one of those cases that happened fairly recently. So there's lots of news footage and things like that on YouTube if you want to check that out. I'm sure I'll include some in the video as well. And what kind of sticks out to me in this case is like I feel like we warn our daughters about like certain things but we don't really warn them about the men who want to rush into relationships rush into moving in, rush into marriage. Like sometimes it's not always what it seems, especially men from other countries trying to rush you down the altar so they can secure their spot in the States. I feel like that happens more than we realize. And women in these situations feel stuck. I don't know, but that is a wrap on today's case. Before we close out, y'all have been tagging me in so many of like the Susie pesto stitches, the true crime ones on TikTok. So I'm gonna put a couple of the Susie pesto stitches y'all have been tagging me in in the end of this video. Sure about pesto. Wow, Susie, that is crazy. Almost as crazy as this one time back in 2019 when I was made aware of this fake Facebook profile that was using my pictures and my name, but instead of it being Sophie Phelps Swaney, it was Sophie Ray Swaney. And this Sophie Ray Swaney account was in a relationship with this guy named Jacob McGuire who had a mohawk. And there was photoshopped pictures of me with this Jacob McGuire guy and also like sonograms as if I was pregnant. And I was like, hmm, that's kind of weird. But like, there's people that make fake profiles of me all the time. You know, I'm just gonna report it and block it and move on with my life. So I move on with my life don't think much of it and then a couple months later it's the beginning of 2020 and all of a sudden you are bombarded with hundreds of messages on Facebook and Instagram of people being like the skin suit video the FBI the CIA the skin suit and you're like skin suit what the fuck are y'all talking about? So you finally find the video on Facebook and it is a video of this Jacob McGuire guy with his mohawk and this like morbidly obese woman. And the girl is claiming that she is the real Sophie, but that the real Sophie has actually been put inside of her, that the FBI has her inside of a skin suit. And that the Sophie that everybody sees on social media, on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok is actually an FBI clone of her. And that she's the real Sophie. And the Sophie that's out there on social media is living at her dad's house and riding her horses and shooting her guns and playing with her dogs and all this other very insane stuff. And it's like a 10 minute long video of Jacob McGuire and this girl claiming that the real Sophie is in the skin suit inside of her body and that she's four months pregnant and it's so unhealthy and it's not good for her and that the FBI needs to come and take her out of this skin suit. And you're like, 
what the fuck? This is fucking weird. And all of the comments are people tagging the FBI in a skin suit and the video is going viral and you're like, this is so fucking weird. And then you look the next day and the video is gone, which luckily you screen recorded part of it. So you still have part of it. You're like, man, that was really weird. And then you just move on with your life because what are you going to do about it? So then a couple months goes by and it's like peak COVID season and you have a friend come and pick you up and take you to the tanning bed because your truck is in the shop. And when you get to the tanning bed, you get a notification on your ring doorbell that somebody is at your front door and you look and you see a guy facing the other way and you're like, oh, it's probably the mailman who needs like a signature or something. So you get on there and you're like, hi, can I help you? And the guy turns around and oh, he has a mohawk and it's Jacob McGuire standing at your front door and you're like oh my god this is not good like and you tell your friend like call the police and tell them to get to my house right now this is not good and you answer and you're like uh can I help you and he's like yeah I'm looking for Randall Swaney and Sophie Swaney my name is Jacob McGuire and you're like um what and he's like I need Sophie Swaney I need Sophie Swaney and you're like um she doesn't live here like you have the wrong address so then he leaves and you're like oh my gosh this is so weird so the police meet you at your house and then you explain to them the whole situation and you show them the video on Facebook that you screen recorded and you see See everything else and if y'all want to see that video let me know because I still have it and they're like okay you know we're gonna make a report of this but we can't actually like do anything about it because he didn't actually like violate any laws and you're like man that sucks but at least there's like a paper trail that this happened because this is fucking insane and now he has your address and he knows where you live even though you told him that you didn't live there so then you go back inside of your house after the police leave and you check your email and you have an email from a U.S. Marshal and it's like hi Sophie this is U.S. Marshal so and so um we had a gentleman named Jacob McGuire show up at our office today claiming that you were his wife and that you had been kidnapped um you know he seemed like he was in a lot of trouble and basically was like really really messed up do you know this person are you okay can you just respond to me to let me know if this person is you know basically wrong or what's going on because i am worried about you so you think oh my gosh this is jacob mcguire pretending to be a u.s marshal and then you look it up and you look the guy's name up and it turns out he is actually a u.s marshal so you're you're like, okay. So then you call them and the U.S. Marshal's office in Little Rock, Arkansas, because you live in Memphis at the time. And you're like, hi, I'm looking for, you know, U.S. Marshal so-and-so. And they're like, oh, he's not here. And you're like, well, my name is Sophie Swaney. And I just had this guy show up at my house um, claiming that the FBI kidnapped me looking for me. And I got an email from this U.S. Marshal that he had been there first. So I'm trying to get in touch with him. And they're like, oh my gosh, yes, we will get him in touch with you. So you get off the phone and he immediately calls you from his cell phone. And he explains that earlier in the day, the guy and the girl from from the video drove all the way from Alabama to to Little Rock, Arkansas, and went into the U.S. Marshal's office and was like, hey, my wife has been kidnapped by the FBI and the CIA. I need help. And they're like, okay, like, come sit down with us. Let's figure this out. And they start talking and asking him like, hey, when is her birthday? Like, where was she born? How long have y'all been married? And he can't answer any of the questions. Or they're like, hmm, this is weird. So then they go in the back to look up information on him. And when they come back out, he and the girl have left and apparently driven to my house in Memphis. And he's like, you know, I just need you to know this is actually a dangerous situation. This guy, Jacob McGuire, has 27 counts of false imprisonment against him on top of having kidnapping charges and um, domestic violence and assault charges against him. And you're like, oh my gosh, what in the world? What happened? He's like, apparently he's a meth head and he thought that his last girlfriend was also a skin suit from the FBI. So he kidnapped her and held her hostage in his house and then cut her open to prove that she was a skin suit, even though obviously she wasn't. And he got released. And you're like, what? why would this person be released? Like, what in the world? This is so scary. So they're able to put an APB out for him and find him and he gets pulled over when him and that girl are on the way back to Alabama and they get arrested and while you're in the process of getting an order of protection against him and and basically charging him with all this stuff you get a text message on April 1st that he's been released from jail and you're like ha April Fool's like he's been released and then it's like wait this is not an April Fool's who's he's literally been released and this guy is just running free and is a meth head who thinks that the FBI has kidnapped me and now he knows where I live and he's going to come and find me and kidnap me and cut me open but you don't don't hear anything about it for months and you're like okay maybe everything is cool and then it's been three years and then about five days ago I get a text message from somebody that's like hey Jacob McGuire is at it again and it's a screenshot of Jacob McGuire's Facebook and it's all of these posts about Sophie I need you I need to find you but instead this time instead of me being the skin suit and his girlfriend that's been locked up I am his daughter that the FBI has kidnapped and he's looking for me again and you're like wow Jacob McGuire is at it again but pesto that's crazy and that one is this is crazy to me because i feel like being stalked by someone who knows you and like has a real relationship with you is one thing but being stalked by somebody who has no clue who you are has never met you in person has just formed this weird thing in their head this psychotic thing in their head this meth fueled psych psychosis i don't know
That is terrifying. Call me crazy if you want, but I've never liked store bought pesto. Oh, you crazy. Obviously, I don't think I can top that, but I do have an interesting story for you. So I grew up in a neighborhood in San Antonio where there were a ton of kids. And specifically on my street, there were kids my age across the street, next door to me on either side and diagonally. My best girlfriend was the girl that lived diagonally to us, Jackie. But my best guy friend as a kid was the person who lived directly across the street from us, Colin. And I went through my old photo album um, to find a picture. And so this is me and Colin. This is also my little brother, Grant. And Colin had a little sister named Megan, who was also Grant's age. So it was perfect. Until Colin and Megan had to move to Florida for, I guess, their dad's job. I don't really remember. But I remember being so heartbroken. It's like, that was my best friend, you know? but my parents were really sweet. And every single year we would go on spring break to Florida to hang out with Colin and Megan. And my parents kind of went through this financial thing and we could no longer afford to go to Florida for spring break to go visit them. So me and Colin just kind of fell out of touch. My little brother Grant and his little sister Megan were too young to really stay in touch. And so I just didn't hear from them again for a very long time. 2016, I was just like going through literally this old photo album, saw this picture of me and Colin, and was like, oh my God, I wonder what he's up to. So I get on Facebook and I type in Colin Campbell and a bunch of Colin Campbells come up, but I can't find him. So then I go to Instagram and I type in Colin Campbell. And again, I can't find him. So I'm like, okay, well, let me try Megan. Type in Megan Campbell, find her. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so beautiful. I'm like scrolling through her photos and I find a, a family photo. I click on that. I find Colin. And I'm like, Colin's kind of cute. So I DM him and I'm like, oh my gosh. Hey, Colin, how are you? I just found this photo of us. I, I hope you're doing well. Like, let's do a call sometime. Like, let's catch up. But after a couple of days passed, um, I didn't hear anything. I like went back on, I think it was Megan's profile first. And um, yeah, I just had a weird feeling about it. And so I scrolled through her photos and I realized she had stopped posting in like 2014. And at this time, I think I said it's 2016 or 18. I'm not really sure. It's an even number. But then I start going through the comments and people are commenting like broken hearts and like the dove emojis and like thought of you today. And I'm like, oh no. So I go to Colin's Instagram and it's the same thing and like, People on Colin's Instagram are like, that was so unfair, rest in peace. And I'm like, what happened? So I Google Colin Megan Campbell, Florida. And Susie, this is where it gets crazy, but also like super sad. And I read about how their dad Darren Campbell, this guy right here, God. Megan and Colin and his wife, their mom, doused the house in gasoline, lit the house on fire, and then himself, and was caught on CCTV the day before buying a ton of fireworks. And to this day, I look it up every single year to see if, like, someone has figured out why he did that. And nobody really has an answer. Obviously, um, when I found that out, I wept. Um, I also went back to counseling and, like, processed that because it was just, like, it's quite a lot for me. Um but super, super sad um, and very dark. You can also read about it and like Google it. It's super sad. Also, if you're watching this and you're not Susie and you have your own true crime podcast or you investigate this kind of stuff, um, help us find answers for this because what the heck? Googling and finding out that my childhood best friend not only died but was tragically murdered by his father would have sent me spiraling. That would have been my 13th reason. But child, that is a wrap.
on today's true crime and makeup video if this was your first time here make sure you subscribe before you leave and i will see y'all next time bye guys Chloe Randolph was found dead in a closet inside of her apartment. Randolph's estranged husband, Mohammed Abdikadir, was arrested for her murder and pled guilty to the charges. Abdikadir was sentenced to 20 years in prison and he gave up his right to an appeal as well as early parole. He will get credit for the two and a half years he's already served. Randolph's parents and brothers were at the hearing today. They said 20 years is not enough, but they accept it. Last year in April, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir signed the Chloe Randolph Act into law. That law provides additional rights and protections for the families of murder victims. It also prevents murder suspects from claiming the body of a victim after a crime. New information tonight in a homicide investigation in Henderson. Mohammed Abi Qadir has now been charged with the murder of his estranged wife, Chloe Abdi Qadir. Henderson police transported Mohammed to the Henderson County Jail around 2.30 this afternoon after police in Arkansas arrested him there earlier this week. Police say Mohammed Abi Qadir admitted to hitting Chloe with a hammer several times and then slit her throat. Police say he then put her body in a closet, took a shower, and left. There were multiple calls, previous calls, in reference to a possible domestic or a verbal argument of some sort between the two um, prior to this incident. Couple had a nine-month-old son. Police say the child was found with Mohammed in Arkansas and is safe tonight.